Hmm. I should probably make a new video, huh? Girl, I must... Welcome back to another games I finished this year so far. A weird public journal entry where I talk about games, I don't feel like making an actual full video about yada yada yada, you know to deal at this point. Let's start with the volley of disappointment. As I did last year, I put together a list of games I wanted to finish and then slowly made my way through it, most of which is going to be covered in this and the following video. I enjoyed or at least got what I expected from most of them, but there's been a few I've been looking forward to for one reason or another and ended up being kinda disappointed. This doesn't mean these games are bad, just not as good as I wanted them to be. First we have Tomb Raider Underworld. Legends was a pretty nice surprise for me last year. I assumed I would find it too dated compared to the modern survival trilogy, but that did not happen. I ended up enjoying it more than that I would, with its set pieces, atmosphere and overall spectacle of its simple but fun story and gameplay. Underworld does not have this. There is not a single memorable wow moment. Lovers are filled with annoying puzzles and gimmicks. Story is going for a slightly more serious tone and completely loses the charm of the previous game while also being more convoluted. This how I managed to make the simplistic platforming and combat worse. Combat specifically wasn't anything amazing in Legends either, but it worked. It was fast and responsive and didn't get in the way. Underworld's version of the system is more cumbersome and filled with annoying enemies, making the momentum and gameplay much more of a chore than it should be. And while the platforming still works the same, the levels are just harder to get around in. I think it's because they tried to make the locations look more natural and parts of the level which are interactive often blend into the rest with too much. But I'm still a fan of the series and plan to go through the rest of it as well, and I hope Anniversary or even original game is washed with after taste Underworld left. Another game in the volume of disappointment is Prince of Persia Sense of Time, which is actually kind of a similar case to Underworld. It's full with annoying puzzles, its story feels oddly charmless, its combat, while having few good ideas, it has clumsy controls and anime design, and the platforming ranges from pretty decent to complete hell. I think it's saying that its most unique mechanic, the dagger of time, is mostly used to reverse the issues created by the clumsiness of these mechanics, not to strategize or create a unique gameplay on its own. All of this could be summed up by this game aging poorly and most of its best qualities being improved in the titles that came after it. And by that I don't mean that its main issue is being old and I need to stop being a whiny zoomer. One of my favorite games last year was Beyond Good and Evil, which is a game from the same genre, released the same year, by the same publisher, on the same engine. What makes these two different then? Find out here. And the last and overall worst game in the volume of disappointment is Dawn of War 2. Two games I finished and greatly enjoyed last year were Space Marine and Combino of Heroes 2, so trying out a game which linked the two together seemed like a smart idea. It wasn't. Repetitive missions, boring, predictable story, show RPG gimmicks and gameplay that's small enough to like spectacle and too simplistic to have a more intimate, tactical feel at the same time. No, I didn't like this one at all. It's so not that I got that off my chest, we can move on to better things. Deadly Premonition is a mess. It often looks like mud, it has awful sound design and music editing that occasionally completely ruins the mood. Its gameplay is a mix of a simple puzzle solving and a bad variation of Resident Evil 4. Its final twists are absurd, its driving physics are awful, its open world is annoying to get around in and most of its side content is pretty meh. But you know all of that. You know the memes. You know the infamy. Some of you might have even actually pulled through this game. And even though it's a mess, it's an amazing mess. Not even in the so bad it's good Tommy Wiseau type of game, it legitimately has its good qualities. It has a soul, its characters, its slick dialogue, its captivating atmosphere, its uniqueness. It feels like a strange underground PS2 survival horror game, which it kinda is I guess. None of the problems are critical enough to actually really damage the experience, and most of them have aspects to balance them out anyways. Graphics are ugly, but the art direction is really good. Sound design is messy, but the actual OST and voice acting is great. Its gameplay is a simple third person shooter, but it's not buggy and doesn't get in the way of its strong atmosphere. And its open world is not great, but... Okay, I don't really have a counterpoint for that one, but it's okay. All that matters is that this game is ultimately a unique, unforgettable experience, one which I definitely recommend. If you have the patience for it, that is. And since we're on the topic of really weird games which don't show their best qualities for free, Killer7. That might be a bit unfair, as this was definitely easier to go to than Little Premonition, but still. Its main strengths are actually very similar to it as well. It's a wild, weird ride. From made assassins wearing anime girl masks, to one of your partners being a ghost, to fighting Power Rangers. This game is a collection of out there, bizarre moments, and I loved every second of it. This is combined with its unique gameplay, which is a strange mix of, of on rails shooter and a puzzle slash survival horror game. It takes a while before the on parts get more interesting, before more enemy types and mechanics start to show up, 
but once they do, it's great. This is all combined with its mechanics of instantly switching between members of your team, all with their own weapons, powers and abilities. But its best quality isn't the gameplay or its memorable moments or its weird story, it's the vibe. That's a really hard thing to quickly explain, but there's just something about the way this game is edited and written and designed that makes it feel truly unique. And I know I throw that term around more than I should sometimes, but I really mean it this time. There is nothing I can compare this game to. There are games with similar tones or art styles or gameplay, but there is not a game that works with all of its elements and combines them in this way. This is my first Suda51 game, first real Suda51 game that is, and if I ever get a chance of playing more games from this catalog, I won't hesitate. Ok, let's start going through this more quickly now, as there's still a bunch of games left and I'm not age bumper guy. Talking about games that feel like their own unique thing, I finally finished Jet Set Radio, one of my all-time favorite albums, accompanied by a game. I really wanted to like this and didn't end up hating it in the end, but Jet Set Radio was still more fascinating than I would like, very stilted, awkward controls and annoying level design. Its incredible vibe saves it from being bad, from its characters to its amazing music to its light hearted story. I just wish I would have to deal with doses of frustration every time I try to enjoy this vibe. And I also hope Bump Rush Cyberfunk finally sketches this inch. Mm -hmm. This year I also wanted to finish Need for Speed 2015 and Deadloop. Emphasis on Wanted, as I couldn't because of awful optimization and weak hardware respectively, which is why I had to find replacement games. I chose the energy method and somehow got two puzzle platformers with a focus on story. Thomas was alone and even remains. Thomas was alone is maybe a bit too self-serious at times and Evans Remains feels too short for the kind of story it tries to tell, but both of them are still charming little games and I definitely recommend if you're looking for a way to kill time during a free afternoon. Another duo of similar games I finished are Everhood and OneShot, both of which are fun and quirky, Earthbound likes. OneShot is actually one of the first games of this meta in the RPG revival we've been seeing, and it's taken it even further than most. You are one of the main characters. It's cute, funny, occasionally really sad and best experience with a guide, just as every good game of this type should be. <laughs> just don't forget to go through its extended epilogue as well, it's totally worth it. And Everhood is... Interesting. It has a slightly darker tone than most of the games of this type and has a really interesting twist halfway through that completely changes the game, combined with a unique combat system. It's maybe not as overall charming as some others in this genre, as I'm honestly struggling to recall a single character apart from the funny ATM thingy, but it's still a game worth going through, just so you can find out the truth. I also finished Forza Horizon 4 and Monster Hunter World. Reason why I'm grouping these together, even though they're very different games from very different genres, is simple. The finished is in huge quotations for both of them. I finished both of its main campaigns, went through all of the races in Forza and defeated the final boss of the Iceborne expansion. But there's still so much left to do. I still have tons of missions to do and lots of equipment to collect in Monster Hunter, not even mentioning its collaborative events and monsters I didn't even encounter yet. And not only is returning to game for weeks and months directly built into Forza's core gameplay with its seasons, I still better touch its Horizon stories and have to try its online content more. Both of these games are amazing, rich in their content, complex, varied, extensive, occasionally frustrating, beautiful and polished. Both are also games that I'm currently playing and planning to play over an extended period of time, which is the first to me. If we ignore my toxic relationship with the roguelike genre or my short daily grinds of the occasional gacha game, I tend to prefer games that I can finish and put down, getting my experience with them, whether it was good or bad. But with these two, I don't mind the idea of them going on indefinitely. Games I can return to and just play without having to bother with paying attention to a more directed experience, playing a video playlist, anime series or a podcast in the background. And I might have to make videos about the exact reasons about why I love these games eventually as well. Let's go through one more game to close this video off, Middle Earth Shadow of War. This is a fascinating sequel, as it's both a huge improvement and downgrade to its predecessor. Let's start with the good. It plays so much better and smoother than Shadow of Mordor, which means quite a lot considering how fun that game already was. I can't imagine playing without some of the new abilities, namely the early aiming or double jump. Not only is Stallion's move and skills extended, it's also much more customizable. It changes the rune system into a full-on gear system, with more impactful stats and bonuses. And every ability now also has sub-abilities that alter its function, for example changing your flash of light into a burst of fire or your ground takedown into a ground beatdown. Then you also have the improved structure. The biggest weakness of Shadow of Mordor was its mech main campaign, with forget story and boring objectives. It didn't really matter because of how fun playing now with the Nemesis system was, but it was still an issue. 
How does Shadow of War address this? Well, granted, the missions themselves still aren't amazing in their gameplay, but the context they're put in is improved. Shadow of War opening hours are pretty like luster, but after Toast the game opens and mainly introduces its several main storylines which you can follow in any order you'd like, each with a different plot and main focus. From helping Gondorian soldiers to hunting down ancient demons with the help of a forest spirit to setting up your own army. They also bring something that was sort of lacking from the campaign of the first game. Spectacle. I don't care if the gameplay of this mission is simple, if they also look this cool. Some of these missions even go as far as to dynamically include orcs you already met with in the open world, making them feel much more personal and more connected to the rest of the game. And with that we're getting to its by far biggest improvement. It finally realizes the vision of the first game. You're actually building an army now, with a set of orcs that are more interesting and diverse both in their personalities and powers, with more ways to make them grow and more personal to you. Not even mentioning how fun and addictive the main activity of this game, the sieges, are, with its plan building and preparations. You don't even care that the rest of the open world content is kinda mech and generic. At least there's not much of it and it's relatively easy to breeze through. Ok, so, it feels better to play, it has a better structure and it finally realizes what the first game set out to do. Where's the catch? It might sound really petty, but this game has one of the most cynical, weird feeling conclusions I ever played to. I don't care if it goes against the lore, tears of weird Lord of the Rings nerds make me happy. I care about how much against everything you've been building towards it feels. I understand expectations can be defied and plot twists are a thing, but this seems like nothing else than a cynical, cheap shock value, and I'm honestly wondering how the third game will handle this and if it manages to wash off the weird aftertaste it left in my mouth, if that ever happens that is. Still, Pleasure of War is one of the most effortless enjoyable open world games I've played in a long time. So that's it for the games I finished this year so far, at least for some of them. I'm sorry for the repeated lack of uploads, the school was kicking my butt this semester, but I survived, that's what's important. I also honestly don't know how many new videos will be in this year. I'm just kinda chilling right now, enjoying the summer break. But my last year of college is closing in and I'm not sure if there'll be any time for this hobby of mine left. There's definitely at least one more video I would like to make and I already mentioned it before, a sequel to this one. At this point I already managed to finish every game from the list of games for this year and obviously there's still a bunch of titles from it I would love to talk about. Some will probably be left out, since I honestly just don't have that much to say about them, but maybe sometimes in the future I will, who knows. There's some other video ideas or even rough scripts I have, but again I'm not sure if I'll actually get onto them. But that's fine, I'm glad I managed to do at least this. I really hope you enjoyed this video as much as I enjoyed making it, and in case you did, please consider liking, sharing or even subscribing, it would help this channel a lot. And as always, my name is Bati, thank you for watching, take care and I'll see you soon. Take,